Hello and welcome to the Switch It Show on ESPNCrickInfo.com. I'm Jonathan Harris-Bass and I'm joined today by Mark Butcher, Alex Winter and Jared Kimber. We start with the Champions Trophy where England have booked their spot in the semi-final after a win against New Zealand in a reduced match which saw an innings from Alistair Cook which included two sixes for the first time in a one-day international, three drops and in the end an invaluable 64 or 47 balls. Um, Mark, he's proving that he's got what it takes possibly to get back in the 2020 setup at the moment. Uh, yeah, I mean, who would have thought it? People that can back and adapt the way they play. Amazing. <laughs> is, that, I mean, is, that, is that just because you never got to play ODI cricket? Well, uh, listen, the there, is, there is no, no hint of, uh, of self-interest in this whatsoever, but it does, it does prove the point that, that good players are good players. Um, uh, great players are, are great players in any format that you put them in. And that's your conclusion to that one. No bitterness whatsoever from no, Mark. No, it, look, it, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I, ne I never ever got the chance to prove it, so I will never know. Um, let alone what anybody else thinks. But um, yeah, I mean, the guy, the guy is a fine, fine player. So if he needs to score at ten and over, he can score at ten and over. If he needs to block the crap out of it for a day and a half, he can do that too. Do you think that it would have been better for you to play in a one-day series before Twitter was around so that, you know, you weren't, you know, getting <laughs> abused all the time? Like, can you imagine if Jonathan Trott ever goes onto Twitter, like, an hour or two after his innings and just searches his name? He'd just sit in the corner and cry. He's like, I've made 86 off 95 balls and I want to hang myself. <laughs> now, listen, do you think that a man who is uh, is capable of such sort of self-possession um, and... and, and sort of tunnel vision as Jonathan Trott would spend any time whatsoever messing about on Twitter. I doubt it very much. I reckon he went on after his last innings and there were lots of people congratulating him and thanking him for getting out on six. I mean, <laughs> who, who knows? Um, Joe Root was the other main contributor for England in this game. Um, and, and then England, after setting themselves up beautifully, Jared, found themselves pinned down by the New Zealand bowlers. And that's not for the first time this summer. Um, and they lost their last... Well, seven wickets for 28 runs, and it and it looked potentially as though it could be quite an average total. I actually thought it was an interesting pitch because it was the sort of pitch that whoever bowled second was always going to look better than the team who bowled first. And I think New Zealand worked out the pitch way too late, which sometimes can happen. And once they worked it out, I mean, we saw from New Zealand it was very hard to score on it. So I think those seven wickets were probably when New Zealand worked out what they needed to do. They did it correctly, and then England at that stage were trying to put on. But, yeah, it's amazing that you can win a game and lose seven for you know, whatever you said, rough number, 12, uh, 28, 7 for 28, um, and still win um, so comfortably, I suppose, in the end. So uh, I thought that it was a pretty good effort by England, but it's, um, it's good that you can go into the next stage of the Champions Trophy by being good at t T20 cricket. Exactly, and that's it. That's something that England set out their stall to do right from the start. Um, Alex, just wonder, did you feel that there was any part of the England team that's going to be rethought for the semi-finals, Tim Bresnan for example? Yeah, he, he's probably the only one that you think uh, might make way with Stephen Finn, especially if there's a bit more pace in the wicket uh, at the Oval, and um, I would suggest that South Africa fear, oh, nice. uh, <laughs> musical interlude, I, I, I would suggest that South Africa are, are, are thinking hard about how to play Stephen Finn than they are Tim Bresnan. I'd, I'd, I'd like to sort of put my uh, stick my oar in there because I don't think the pitch at the Oval is going to have any pace in it. I think if if, if anything, it will be around about the same as the one against Sri Lanka. I know the pitch that uh, that they played on yesterday in the the Sri Lanka game ha had been used before, and so therefore it was crusty and dry and turned. I think England's biggest um, selection sort of chat will be around whether or not if if Swan's fit, whether they play both him and Treadwell in the same in the same team at the Oval because the pitches are so dry there. And we saw how easy it was for Sangakara um, against, the, against the pacemen um, on uh, the, you know, last week in England's defeat. And I also think that South Africa, although they've got some big hitters and you know, pace bowlers can go out the park as well, they're much happier with pace on the ball than they are against the spinners. So um, I, I would think that there would be quite a lot of chat on, in a selection meeting about whether or not they can play both off spinners in that side. That, of course, depends hugely on whether Graham Swan is fit or not, which yeah, uh, yeah. is a huge question. Uh, do you think, though, that, I mean, from the form we've seen so far, England have played three matches, Swan's been fit for one of them, they lost that one, and Treble's been in for the <laughs> other two. At the moment, would you be looking to pick Treble if you're only picking one spinner mark? Um, yeah, yeah, possibly. And, and I don't think, look, sort of be, being in and around uh, the, the players every once in a while, 
you I always get the feeling that 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 particularly the older ones they're kind of they're, they're sort of thinking to themselves well you know what I love playing 2020 and I really love playing in the test matches and if there was one that I that, that I would sort of pass up on barring the major tournaments it would be the 50 over tournament um, and I think when you get to a, get to a point in your career like Graham Swan has and perhaps Kevin Peterson um, you know the over the over 30s where this they seem to spend so much of their time on the road that if they could somehow manage to wangle it to get dropped for 50 over cricket so that they could still play 20 over cricket and play test matches then they would gladly take that um, so you know in terms of, in terms of the England team you want to try and win this top, this competition right so if 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 it comes down to it and there's only one spinner fit and available Treadwell I would go for because he's in form he's playing really well and everybody seems to be having a bit of a struggle um, playing him and scoring five six and over off him so he's in the side going forward it, you know we might not see too much of Graham Swan in, in the colour clothing in 50 over cricket going forward well we that was reflected in his Twitter feed yesterday when Australia was struggling to get up to the total that would mean that England won the group the hashtag no more m4 was being banded around uh, <laughs> uh, rather easily he obviously hasn't enjoyed that drive up to Cardiff very much so well, far now, I think I think they kind of he almost got caught didn't he they they'd started to drive back from drive back from Cardiff to sort of check into the hotel down here to play the the semi final on Wednesday and then Australia were collapsing so disastrously it looked as though they might end up having to go back to uh, to Cardiff all over again and pay the six pound twenty to get into the lovely principality. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I might, you must have seen the Jack D sketch about it because the Welsh are very proud that you only have to pay to get into Wales, whereas you don't have to pay to get out. And Jack D always says that that's because there's a hedge over the Seven Bridge where there's just a cluster of fivers where people have chucked it out the window because they're getting out of Wales so fast. I don't know if there's any truth in that, but I haven't checked it out. Hello um, to the Welsh watchers. <laughs> <laughs> There's no one live. Um, so um, let's take a look at, at England's next opponents. So at the Oval are going to be South Africa, who um, have been a team, Jared, that you've write, written about um, at, at great length on the site, um, which I now know about. And, um, and they're benefiting, perhaps, from some of their, their, their usual team not being available for them. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, it's a bit like what Mark was saying earlier. There's definitely a mood amongst certain senior players in world cricket where one day is not that exciting for them anymore. I mean, KP, you know, has spoken about it. You can see what, the way some of them act. Um, you know, they'll rest themselves from a one day quite happily um, at the moment. And I think that's definitely... And it's the senior players. And the South Africa have a team who've got to number one in the world. And some of those senior players, I think, you know, were happy maybe not to be around this particular tournament. The players don't see this as anywhere near the ultimate. They don't see it anywhere near the way that the ICC are um, trying to sell this as the big eight teams. They really do see it as, you know, just another tournament that they have to play in. So I think there was probably a core amount of the South Africans who felt that way coming in. But for Ryan McLaren and for Chris Morris and for, you know, uh, Colin Miller and, uh, sorry, um, uh, Colin Ing uh, God, there's too many new names in that team. For those, the middle order guys that we've never heard of before, <laughs> that occasionally play in the IPL and are now in this team, you know, uh, from South Africa. God, there's, and there's so many new New Zealand players as well. If you notice that, it's like they invent a player for every a new form. Like, who the hell's Corey Anderson? But anyway, we'll, I'll forget that for a second. But I think for these, these younger guys in South Africa, they are trying to prove themselves because it is so hard to get into that side. The fact that Colin, uh, so the, that Chris Morris has this amazing record in first-class cricket in South Africa, and this is you know, basically the first time he's ever really played one-day cricket for South Africa, that wouldn't happen in any I mean, he'd be captain of Australia with his record at the moment. You know, <laughs> He'd probably be president of the PCB um, in Pakistan. You know, He'd be batting top order in Pakistan, let's be honest. So you know, in South Africa, you really have to prove yourself. So for those guys that are coming through, and someone like McLaren, who's got to 30, who struggled a little bit, suddenly he's on the world stage and he can actually play the way that he's always played in county cricket and he's probably always played in, in um, South African domestic cricket. So they're actually proving themselves. So it's actually quite a good tournament for those sorts of guys because once the big names come back, as good as Chris Morris is and as good as Ryan McLaren is and some of those other guys are, they're probably still going to be squeezed back out because they're not Graham Smith or Dale Stane or Vernon Philander. As a consequence from all of that uh, fantastic chat about South Africa, um, Jared, do you think that they can beat England? 
Uh, I don't think they're as good a side as England at the moment. Um, I think England's probably... I think England's two biggest problems are, are going to be the other two semi-finals. I think England have drawn a very good semi-final for them. I think they line up quite well against South Africa. And like I said, it, even with these guys pushing as hard as they can, England's pretty much going it, up Graham Saw maybe aside. And, well, KP aside, I suppose. But England are going in with a fairly strong side. South Africa is, is still quite weakened, and so England should beat them. But I think England's problem will be, be in the final because I think those two teams are phenomenal, and I don't know if England can keep either of them down to under 300 at the moment on, on a, the drier pitches. Alex, do you think that psychologically England are going to have any baggage from last year? No, not really. I mean, I mean, they gave them a good run in the one-day series, didn't they? And uh, it was... As has been proved when England went out to India, it was a bit of an aberration that uh, that, that Test series. And, and as Jared says, the personnel are a little bit different. So in, England are coming into this semi-final knowing that uh, they've done pretty well to get through the group stage. They haven't played perfect cricket, and they know that they, they do have a little bit more to give. I think they're in a good place. And Butch, I mean, do you think playing at the Oval is going to be a benefit to England or not? Because as you said, the the, the wicket's going to be quite hard to read. Yeah, I think. Well, I think I don't think it'll be hard to read. I think if you if you bat first, you're going to need to. If it's a, a new pitch, which I'm sure it will be for a semi-final, if you bat first, which I would probably probably recommend because uh, because of the way they tend to get worse unless Sri Lanka are batting on them. <laughs> um, if you bat first, you need to get 300. You need to get 310, 315 to to make to make a par score, um, and then you need all your tricks. Um, in terms of defending, you need you know you you need the ball to reverse swing. How that happens, I don't know. Um, you need uh, you need the ball to turn. You need good changes of pace, and you need to bowl good Yorkers. Uh, you know, and, and I and I back in, England's bowlers in the main have been have been fantastic in this competition. They were made to look ordinary by Sangakara, who's a wonderful player on on a surface that he was um, most adapt at playing on. But against South Africa, I think if you put the right score on the board, that you will put them under an enormous amount of pressure. Now you mentioned in there the uh, we're not sure how people are getting the ball to reverse swing. Um, Jimmy Anderson's obviously said it, it takes a great amount of skill. It's been yeah. called a question by someone like Bob Willis. It's been a, a bit of a debate, um, not only um, amongst ex-players and uh, cricket journalists alike, but also on the website of ESPNCricketInfo.com. Lots of people debating about how the ball is manipulated in order for it to reverse swing. Um, do we take it from the fact that the umpires didn't incur a five-run penalty on England, that when they swapped that ball, they weren't accusing them of doing anything illegal? Um, I, I, you know what I think happened? I think, they, I think they, they thought, perhaps, that something had gone on, or that there was something that wasn't right, not that something had gone on. But they didn't, they didn't think they'd be able to prove it, and they weren't quite sure why they had the feeling that something had gone on. And so they made up a, a, a strange excuse, stole the ball off England, and, and, and got on with the game. Um, because you know, I've, we've all known this for years. Players, as players, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wacker Yunus came to play at the Oval in 1990 or whatever, and he taught you know certain bowlers how how you do it. This is how it's done. And back in those days, it was quite primitive. Um, umpires didn't know that what they were looking for. They didn't know why this ball was doing that, and so it, it was. So people got away with it for a long time. Now people everywhere are much more in the loop. They're much more clued up, and so in order to get the ball to reverse swing, if it particularly when it's before 15, 20 overs old, there is an enormous amount of skill involved in making that happen. Um, and you know, to, some people would say that any sort of manipulation, whether it be throwing the ball in so that it hits the rough side, you know, really making an effort to hold it so that the seam is horizontal, so it lands on a, on a pitch, etc., is just the same as scratching it. I don't know. I don't agree with that. Um, you know, the, the, the Pakistani sort of uh, fans and people that watch, you know, watch this particular podcast would be going, well, hang on, if that had been Pakistan, all hell would have bro broken loose. And they probably got a point. Um, however, that it's it's kind of Pakistan's gift to the to the <laughs> to the world of cricket this reverse swing, um, and uh, you know I think I think too much has been has been made of it. The fact that the fact that the umpires didn't make a big call and that they they swapped the ball, it's kind of left left everything up in the air. You know what people are like; they want a definitive answer. We want to know what happened, and we want to put somebody in the in the stocks for it. But uh, I think in the end, it. it pretty much the right thing happened and if England if England had sort of recovered from sulking about it quicker then they might well have won the game but they didn't and and that's that but as it, they still top the group they do still top the group um, Jared I don't know what you think about this uh, the the ball manipulation and and tampering story um but 
for me, no side's really been skittled because of reverse swing in this tournament. So it doesn't suggest that bowlers are getting that much of an advantage against the batsmen, does it? Um, I think uh, Australia struggled against it. I think England definitely um, used it brilliantly against Australia. But, I mean, I'm a Victorian, um, JHB, and, you know, we're practically Pakistani in our ball tampering. I mean, Aaron Finch was done a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, I would, wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, uh, Victorians went out with sandpaper and a toolkit. You know, some of the times when I used to watch Shield cricket and was shocked that the umpire wasn't just turning around, us, you know, I swear that they were chewing on the ball um, to get it to reverse. So it definitely goes on in all cricket. It's it's just how much you can get away with. And um, at the moment, there's you know, there's a particular uh, way of doing. It. I wish I had. If, if, I wish I had a cricket ball around my desk. But there's a particular way that you could do it and get away with it, where there's no camera can get to it. And I think that's what's been happening. I don't think it's just England that's doing it, though. I just think they're doing it better. Um, and look, I'm not sure it could ever be 100% stopped. And maybe you know, just having an umpire as smart as Alim Dada go, yeah, that ball looks a bit dodgy. I'll just change it out for another one. I don't. What I do think was was probably the worst moment was when Alistair Cook got so upset. Um, because if he'd just gone, eh, no worries, and let the ball go, uh, we probably wouldn't be talking about that. But they got so upset in England. They made, it was quite clear that they got this ball hooping around. And uh, <laughs> if, it is re if it was reversing, and uh, George Dobell will tell you it wasn't reversing, and it may be fading a little bit, but they clearly thought they got the ball exactly the way that they wanted it, and it was taken away from them. So it, it's, uh, it's a bit of a shame, I suppose. I mean, the, the, thing, with, the thing with the way that the... the that teams get the ball to reverse swing nowadays. It's not. It's not like everyone can remember Wazi Makran round the wicket, World Cup final, nineteen ninety two, angling the ball miles in at leg stump and it swinging and hitting the top of off. Those were back in the in the days when people didn't know what they were looking for. So the the the, the level of ball tampering back then was far far in excess of of what we have now, and therefore the ball moved far more in a far more exaggerated fashion. All they want to get it get it to do and this is bowlers from everywhere all they want to get it to do is change change direction late by probably as much as two or three inches and that is the difference between you know a, a, a ball bowled as a Yorker that you just miss the length and it becomes a sort of like a long long half volley um, disappearing back over your head for six and the batsman crudding it off the inside edge and smashing it into their ankle you know it, it only has to move so much so you don't get that dramatic, huge curve that we that we used to see back in, in days gone by. But it's just enough to give the batsman a tiny bit of protection should they happen to miss the deli you know the length of delivery tr they're trying to bowl. And that's what all of the bowlers are trying to get it to do. Ultimately, it, I think it's Ian Bishop and Ian O'Brien both agreed last night, which I took a little bit of issue with them on. They said the world wants to see good fast bowling more than it does want to see good batting. So... Um, allow them to tamper with it and we see a lot more good fast bowling. <laughs> I, said, I said I thought we'd like to see battles between good bowlers, good fast bowlers and good batsmen. That's, I think that's the ultimate. Um, now, we're not going to see necessarily a battle between good fast bowling and good batting in the second semi-final, but it'll be an interesting match-up between the two sub-continental uh, teams left in the tournament, India against Sri Lanka. Um, Mark, can you see anyone tripping India up at this stage? Um, no. No. Uh, but, but Sri Lanka have a have have a team that is capable of doing it. I think perhaps perhaps more so than the other two. Um, the, only, the only thing that worries me about Sri Lanka slightly is what happened yesterday. Um, if if Malinga has has one of his rare off days, um, and or and or the batting team decide that they're just gonna they're gonna basically get their feet out of the way and play him as straight as possible and tap him back for, you know. For for a few overs and force him into doing you know to getting ever and ever more attacking as he did yesterday, then where are the rest of their wickets going to come from? And when you when you put them up against the the attack, uh, the batting lineup of, of India, you think well bloody hell, you know you're going to need a little bit more than than Talikaratne Dilshan bowling a few, um, you know phantoms and and Angelo Matthews doing the same um, in order to stop them because their their batting is absolutely sensational. So you can't see them being defeated. I know, Jared, that your, uh, your pick for the tournament, which you're probably delighted about at the moment because they have managed to make it at least to the semi-finals, above and beyond everybody else's pick. Um, Sri Lanka are there in the semis. Uh, but can you see them causing a bit of a shock in that game in Cardiff? Or is it, I mean, it could even be weather affected, in which case India are likely to go through. 
Uh, I'd prefer they weren't playing India at this point. Uh, I suppose the whole world would, since they've now played India 4.8 million times in the last week. Um, you know, so I mean, I I would I would prefer that that didn't happen again. Um, I also think they probably, like I said, I mean, match up really well against England, and I think they probably match up really well against South Africa. Uh, but I still do believe that, unlike I, I, I think that they've got the batting to be able to score over three hundred, and they've got two, um, two pretty good weapons, and also um, Kulasekera, who's in the form of his life, um, and he's not even swinging the ball. He's in the form of he's running people out. He's doing everything, Kulasekera, at the moment. <laughs> um, whereas I look at I look at India, and I don't quite think they have you know they don't have quality um, quite the same. They don't have a Malinga, uh, which no one does. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that Ashwin's on his very best form. And the rest of their bowling attack, I think Sri Lanka would be pretty happy to face. The thing with India is how much runs do you need to be able to, you know, make yourself? Um, because it, as good as your bowling can be, we know that Virat Kohli can probably move any total um, closer. And that's not even including Dhoni. So when you've got when you've got Kohli at the front and, you know, Dhoni in the middle, it just means that anything under 360 is a worry. And I'm not sure that... Uh, you know, watching them yesterday, I didn't think Sri Lanka bats them were in brilliant form. They don't look in great form, but they still were good enough to beat o Australia yesterday. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that, I mean, I mean I, but I they didn't even beat Australia that comfortably. In fact, if Australia just had to chase the 250 odd, um, they probably would have made it if it wasn't for the fact they were trying to get it in 29 overs. So uh, they I was would have, they'd, they'd have played. They'd have played it completely differently if they were. That's the point. The point yeah. is, is that you play the game in a completely different fashion. So they probably would have gone out there and tried to, you know, tried to take the game deep and screwed it up. I mean, you know, they, you know, I, no, there's no doubt Australia would have lost. Like, there's no doubt Australia would have lost the game in almost any way that they would have chosen, Mark. But <laughs> the way that South Af uh, sorry, the way that Sri Lanka played Xavier Doherty didn't exactly uh, exude me with confidence that they're going to come out and start smashing Ashwin everywhere. Yeah, I mean, like I said, that pitch. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of like hogging things from from Alex here, but the, that that pitch at the Oval wasn't wasn't a particularly good one. You know, it was it was old, it was tired, and um, like batting Alex. in a batting in a yeah, like like me too, like in like in a conventional method, it was was perhaps not the way to go. I mean, it was it was only because of a player as good as um, Ayala Jai Wardner that Sri Lanka managed to post anything anywhere near enough. So. Um, it, it wasn't a great surface, but in the end, it turned out to be, you know, quite a dramatic game. It was a dramatic game, um, but let's get back to Australia um, now <laughs> and uh, and and talk about their their woes. Um, it, it's been a miserable few weeks for them. Um, Nagraj wrote on the site, uh, George Bailey felt that the switch in the formats, the change of the ball, the infusion of fresh legs, and the probable return of Clark in the squad could reinvigorate in Australia and arrest the downward spiral. Um, is that just chat, Alex? Yes. And do you care to elaborate <laughs> on that at all? They're just so short of confidence, I think, and um, they've got no one except Clark to turn to. N n no one else in that squad is seemingly going to do anything for them to pick themselves up. They haven't got uh, someone like a Malinga to turn to, to come out with a brilliant spell, to, to just try and create something for them. They've got absolutely nothing at all that you're looking to, thinking, yeah, maybe if he gets going or something happens, they can kick everyone into life. They are so flat. They are so down on confidence. And, uh, well, maybe they're just, just not good enough anyway. So, I mean, the, surely their biggest problem is the fact that the players who've come out of this tournament with any credit, and I would say Mitchell Johnson's one of them, um, Bailey's another one, and Adam Voges is the other, um, none of them are in the Ashes squad, Mark. I mean, that's disastrous. Um, yeah, well, yeah, you're right. That it's disastrous in the fact that the ones being left behind have, have been so so poor. I mean, th there's one guy, one bloke in the in the Aussie lineup that that will be the, perhaps not quite so well known to to English fans or whatever, unless they stay up all night and watch cricket, um, like I do. Um, Darren Pattinson. He's the one bloke I think who can come in and and do something incredibly I hope special. James Pattinson. Uh, sorry, you know what I mean. James Pattinson, much better hair than Darren. Um, he he is a special. He's special, um, and so if he stays fit, and if you know, he he has the he has the ability, I think, to make the sort of impact that a sort of like a, a young Dennis Lilly did back in the day. He's quick. Um, he, he's aggressive. Um, you know, he's kind of you know he's big, good-looking sort of poster boy sort of fella. And if he can come in and 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 start well and not get injured. Then he is the one bright shining light, I think, for Australia. Because you know, the, the, if you think about the batsmen who are going to be coming into the squad from here, is 
um, Cowan and Rogers, um, who else, who have I missed out? But it's not inspiring. It's not kind of, you know, they're not going to come in and go, oh, thank God for that. We've got a bloke who can make, you know, 180 in, in, a, in, in two sessions, or we've got a guy that, that averages 60 in, you know, shield, what Chris Rogers does. But he's not going to. He's not going to. He's not going to dominate to to the to the uh, extent that will will then fill the rest of the batting lineup who are so short of confidence with more confidence. They're going to have to graft. They're going to have to grind. Um, and you know, th there's every chance that they will find themselves, um, you know, two or three games in, ready for the Ashes, not knowing who their first eleven should be. They've got a load of openers. They haven't got too many guys in the middle order. We still don't know about Clark. Um, so they, ha I, I really genuinely think that they're hanging pretty much all of their hopes on uh, on young James Pattinson. Well, to, just to talk about Pattinson for a second and just show how high they um, they rate him in Australia when when uh, Dale Stain was bowling at the Gabba, I, I think it was Ian Healy who described him. He said Dale Stain, he's basically the James Pattinson of South Africa, um, <laughs> which of course made everyone on Twitter have a meltdown, um, and it shows how insular Australian cricket can be. But he is that good, and the only the only other one I suppose is, that can come in and actually can change games is going to be Ryan Harris. Um, and he's going to be fit for approximately two of the ten tests. Um, <laughs> that's going to be the I thought you were going to say two, two, three sessions of the first test. I thought you were going to say. Well, well that too, that too. <laughs> but um, uh, so he's the only other one, and he's right. There's no. It's not like they can suddenly bring someone in. I mean, Joe Burns is a, you know, a good young cricketer, but if he comes in, he's not going to make. It's, he's not the new Ricky Ponting or the new Michael Clark. He's just a good young cricketer, and, and you know, these guys aren't even in the squad. We're just talking about people that they could randomly pick. So there's not a lot around. Doesn't appear to be a lot around. Our weekly discussion of the Australian team on their 2013 Ashes Tour will continue next week with the latest episode of Walkabout Watch. But now we're going to return to domestic matters. And Mark, something I should imagine very close to your heart, Surrey have taken the route of many Premier League football clubs by sacking their manager Chris Adams and assistant Ian Salisbury mid-season. Um, do you feel it was an unavoidable decision? Um, I, I think it was on the cards, yeah. I think it had been coming coming for quite some time actually um, the uh, uh, you know you, you go back to the, the tragedy of last year of which we were on the uh, you know it's to, it's today it was a year ago today that, uh, that Tom Maynard um, lost his life um, the you know the subsequent sort of forays into the into the transfer mar for market um, Ricky Ponting and Graham Smith aside because I think they're fabulous signings any club would be would be more than happy to have them but some of the uh, some of the older ones um, the way that the young players just seem to be, with the exception of Rory Burns, seem to be kind of floundering around and not making any improvements four or five years down the line. And the ones that are making improvements are doing so um, under the tutelage of, of another, another, another county. Um, Chris Jordan would be the, the main example of that, who I think is a fabulous cricket. I, was, I, I signed him. I was in the room when, when we made the decision to give him a, a contract as a 16, 17-year-old. Um, he's now sort of top of the top of the most valuable player list in county cricket this summer. I think all of those factors have sort of combined to, to, uh, to, 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 for this decision to happen. Um, the, the thing with, I suppose, the thing with Surrey County Cricket Club that, that makes it differ from 90% from of the other counties is that, that there is a weight of expectation and there is also that sort of outside feeling that it's a, a club which is blessed with enormous riches and that they, they ought to... Um, use them more wisely or at least if you're going to use them use them in, in terms of getting some sort of success and at the moment there, there doesn't seem to be any of that going around and i and i know from having been there i've played there for 20 years that um the uh, the expectation is sometimes unrealistic i mean it would have been 19 years between championship victories when we won our first in 1999 so this sort of feeling that surrey is this dominant force in cricket has never actually been true since the 50s but that's the expectation that any management group team um, comes under when they play, when they represent that club and if things don't go well over a course of a, a period of time this is inevitably what happened. Alex Stewart sort of stepping into the temporary breach um, is it something that in, interests you sort of the taking over a, a bigger role at Surrey at any stage? Um, I never say never but at, at the moment no it's not on it's not high up on the agenda what what you know I would never I would never turn down the um, perhaps the opportunity to to run an eye over some of the young the young batters. I think that we've got some good ones there. Some some that aren't actually in the uh, 
in the lineup at the moment, and, and there's a definite need um, to sort of to push through or to try and identify some some really young talent. Because I think one of the one of the problems, or one of the things that was successful about the club in in my time there, um, albeit it was a roller coaster of success, um, was that the team by and large was were Surrey players, were guys that had grown up in the county and had represented the county as as, as young players, and I think. You have to. All counties have a duty to the to themselves and to the to, to where the money comes from. I.e., um, you know, centrally, to 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 keep their house in order and to make make that work. To to sort of push out investments, push out valued um, you know, players that have value to back to the England setup from within. Um, and so that's you know that would always be a, a priority in terms of in terms of any county, I should think. And. Um... As you've already mentioned, uh, today is the, the one-year anniversary of Tom Maynard's death. Just from within the county, um, how, how, what, what is the feeling now, one year on? I mean, it doesn't feel as though they've moved on that far. Um, I don't. I mean, look, I can only imagine what what to, the, the players went through during during last season. Um, what what. Tom's family has gone through since and continues to go through, um, and, and all I know is from from experience of having of, of having similar um, tragedy occur, you know, back in back in the day when I was at the club, that it takes a long time for, for people to get over it. Um, it takes a long time for the for those particular wounds to heal, and it also takes a long time to kind of to replace. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, the purely in playing terms. He lost a lost a very very fine young player. Um, the, the the captain um, moved on. Uh, Mark Rambrakesh was was retired, or however you want to put it, at the same time. So there was a big hole left in in that side. Um, and some and some might say that that was the the the, the decisions made in, in terms of bringing in a very sort of young and, and inexperienced and, and at times. Um, Unreliable captain uh, that you were that you were asking for some sort of trouble, not not the trouble that uh, that ended up coming. Um, and you know, so that there are a lot of a lot of decisions that have been made before and since that have that have made things difficult for the for the incumbents. I think, and uh, the, the the club has to move on. That's the only way forward. It will, and it and it, it shall, and hopefully it will move on in terms of really promoting sort of young Surrey boys and, and young men into into that team to fill the gap. And Jared and Alex, I know, will have been listening with great interest to this. Um, Jared, uh, for, for you, for, for Surrey County Cricket Club, this season, what would you imagine their, their goal is? Is it just Division 1 status retention? Yeah, they're going to want to stay up. I, I suppose they're going to want to stay up for two reasons as well, because they're going to want to get whether it is Mark, who I believe has already signed as coach and has just been lying to us for all this time, <laughs> <laughs> or whether it's and, someone... and, and leave the leave the uh, you know leave the possibility of speaking to you guys on a sort of thrice weekly basis. You must no, be mad. No, we just get you in the same way we get Angus in, where he's really grumpy and he doesn't want to do it. Um, <laughs> and no, no, so I mean, I, I think um, I think if you're you know, if they're going after a big name coach, and let's be honest, Surrey's the only team really that is a big county team in the. They're, they're the only team that really makes sense losing a coach mid-season. They're the only team that everyone really follows, even if they don't want to. They're the only team with masses of amounts of money. They're the only team with John Major. You know, they're you know they're big. They're a bigger team than than most other county oh, teams. Oh, so oh, oh, hold on a second, Jared. My my phone, which was on earlier, is still on, but it's on silent. I've got Hopsy ringing in right now. He's. I think he wants to say something about Yorkshire. Maybe they got no money. They got no money, and they got no John Major. Okay. <laughs> completely different situation but I mean Surrey is a is a sort of a bigger club so it, they're going to want to get a big name coach now when I say a big name coach it may not be the most famous coach or whatever but it will be someone who's probably close to international level or has a very high profile if that's the case that coach is going to want to take over a division one team so that's what Surrey has to try and do they have to try and you know maintain that because no I don't I could be wrong here but if I was a, a coach who's on the you know close to international, wants to get to international, has just come back from international. I don't want to take over a team that's in Division 2 and have to get them back up. I want to take over a team that's in Division 1. Uh, unless they go, unless they do pick Alex Stewart or Mark or someone like that. But I, So I think it's very important that they stay up. And I think this has been coming for a long time. And, you know, Chris Adams, is. He, if you look through his entire record, it's a very 
it's very interesting. He's sort of gone up and down, you know, the way that the team has gone, you know, and what they did this year was, um, it was odd uh, with the, the signings that they made. And it's also probably been made worse, but as Mark mentioned, by the fact that Chris Jordan leaves and every year, every Surrey supporter would come up at the start of the year and go, this is going to be the year of Chris Jordan. We believe in him. He's amazing. We can't wait. And every year he'd play one or two games and disappear early on in the season. He finally goes to another club and just absolutely smashes it. That just makes Chris Adams look worse. It does make him look worse. Alex, from what you've heard, both Mark and Jared say there, um, Jared took, talks about a big name coach. Sounds to me, from what Mark said about the, the success when he was playing there, that perhaps what they need is, is someone who's, who's homegrown to come through. Yeah, definitely. And I also don't think it's the worst um, idea in the world. I obviously won't plan for it, but it's not the worst thing if they go down because it'll give them another chance, even though they've been starting again and again for the last three to four years. Well, it's been longer than that. It's been about ten, actually. <laughs> Alex is only four years old, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, Alex, sorry. To put a clean slate under it, I, I, I remember watching um, Surrey of Bristol back in 2009, and this, uh, this uh, bright young bowler called Stuart Meeker, it, 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 the bowler at the rate of knots coming in. And, and that was sort of really exciting times. And, and, and Surrey have, have got these other young guys and, and these young... The, the bowling attack, you, you could easily um, select four youngsters to play. And I think Division 2 might give those guys a little bit more of a chance and someone to really get the club back to its roots perhaps would be better than maybe a big name coming in, more big name signings, yeah. more, more chasing results, which is, which is what they've done. You mentioned the football decision about getting rid of the coach. It's because they're chasing results. And to Surrey, that shouldn't matter as much because they've got an international ground that's making all their money. They don't rely on the county side as much to bring in their revenue. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a massively interesting point because that in, inevitably what happens at the, at the club is the expectation drives this, you know, you, you, Chris Adams himself started off wanting, you know, young young players, young side, get rid of the dead wood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then four years, four and a half years on, ends up in exactly the, the same situation. Um, that, that he took over in, it, with the exception of the fact that he actually bought the players there. You know, the, the squad that he inherited was, was okay, it was getting old, and we, was, we were still chasing, <laughs> chasing results back, back in the day. But, but had been, most of those players had been there for a long time. He's gone and brought in a load of, load of people who were at the, the, end of, you know, the end of the road in, at the counties they'd been at for many years and were starting afresh at, you know, on the way down, on, on the slide, and that's and that's an extraordinary thing. But that's what being coach of, of, of a club like Surrey does, because you it, results are demanded of you. Now, the big name thing for me is not is wouldn't be the answer, or or you know, the, obviously Graham Smith is captain of the club. Um, you know, he's not there injured, etc. Um, but he'll be back next year, so people will be looking. You know, maybe maybe. A, I don't know Gary Kirsten or somebody like that who's out the job. Get another South African in. They know each other well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What what I wanted or what I would have liked um, way back in two thousand and eight was for for there to be somebody there who who was who knew everything about the county from under nines upwards. Because you you in in county cricket you don't so much need a coach. What you need is somebody there who is a who's a fantastic recognizer of young talent and a nurturer of young talent and then you know that then the club itself in terms of you know, whoever's sort of director or whatever fancy types you want to call them they then you know have the responsibility for finding an overseas player for a two-week window or whatever it is whatever nonsense has to happen nowadays but the rest of it is fundamentally what you have coming when it's going to be ready when you introduce it and who out of the, the sort of like the senior players do you desperately need to keep around in terms of their productivity and in terms of their, their, their nurturing skills on the field in order to make the whole thing move forward. Um, so big name, not so, in, not so interested. Somebody that's fantastic and has the time and the commitment and the, and the wants to put the effort in in terms of finding out and bringing through all those young players is absolutely essential. Um, and that means somebody that's going to be around 12 months of the year and is going to be bloody interested enough to go down to academies, who's going to go to second team matches, who's going to spend the winter driving around looking at 15-year-olds. That's... That for me is where is where county cricket needs to be everywhere, not just at the Oval. Um, and you know, you look at somebody like Jason Gillespie at Yorkshire, and you know, sudden, they've got this suddenly this production line of 15-year-olds to 21-year-olds are all coming into to the first team and doing well. That's a situ scenario that every club would want, 
um, you know, hopefully Yorkshire make the best of it for now, and hopefully Surrey will be doing so in in the coming years. Matthew Nicholson. <laughs> ah, so, uh, yeah, overseas player. Yeah, big Correct. name. Yeah. Well, maybe not big name. <laughs> I was going to say, well, we, can't, we can't have Mark taking over then as a consequence because he would be too much of a big name. Um, but <laughs> I, I, li I like the idea of the return to grassroots for all counties. And I think what has been achieved at Yorkshire, um, much as it pains me to say it on this podcast, because we try and be as anti-Yorkshire as possible, um, <laughs> is that they've done a, a very good job. And um, well, we wish them all the success. We wish Surrey all the success in the future as well. And, and whoever replaces Chris Adams on a permanent basis, um, hopefully the club can can turn itself around. That's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, today. All that remains for me to say is thank you very much to Mark, to Jared, and to Alex, who I apologise for keeping him down to about 30 seconds of contribution. I've been Jonathan Harris. -Bass. It's as much as Holly Willoughby on uh, The Voice. There you go, if you watch you're, the You're voice. almost as gorgeous as her as well. <laughs> thank you very much. Until the next time, when we we will be basking in the glory of an England victory in the Champions Trophy that will live long into the memory and Jared will remember forevermore. This has been the Switch Hit Show on ESPNCrickInfo.com.